Welcome. Uh, my name is Lucan Wei. I'm a um, professor of political science at the University of Toronto and at the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies. Welcome to our event on Crimea. Um, I decided to, hold, to organize an event on Crimea because, as you all know, Crimea was invaded seven years ago, was in, you know, inundated the news for about a few weeks, but then sort of disappeared um, from the news cycle. And we haven't really heard very much about what's going on there. But of course, the occupation continues. And so today I wanted to bring together uh, four different experts coming from very different perspectives to talk about um, the situation in Crimea um, and both um, what's going on in Crimea, historical background, but also Crimea's impact on Ukrainian politics. But before I begin, I want to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting is still the home of many indigenous peoples from the Turtle Island, and we are grateful for the opportunity to work on this land. So today, uh, we have with us, um, I'll go in the order they will be speaking, Victor Asapchuk um, from the University of Toronto here in Toronto. Um, he's an associate professor of Ottoman and Turkish studies and a historian of the uh, Ottoman Empire. He's the author of the book, The Ottoman Black Sea Frontier and the Relations with, of the Port with the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth of Mus and Muscovy. And his interests focus on the administration of warfare as well as uh, tax institutions. Next. Um, from Kyiv, we have Max Zvezhensev, um, who recently completed his PhD at the University of Western Ontario. Uh, he is also a graduate of the Kyiv Mohila Academy and Warsaw University. His research focuses on the history of post-Soviet Crimea. Um, and um, next, we have Professor Gwendolyn Sass. Uh, who is the director of the Center of, of East European and International Studies in Berlin. And she's a she, senior research fellow at Nuffield College and a non-resident senior fellow at the Car Carnegie Europe. Her research interests include post-communist transitions, dynamics of war, uh, prot protests and migration. Uh, most, most significantly in terms of this panel, her, her monograph, The Crimea Question, Identity, Transition and Conflict, was published by Harvard University Press in 2007 and won the Alec Nova Prize for the best book awarded by the British Association of Slavonic and East European Studies. Uh, last but not least, we have Dr. Alexander Fazun, um, who is uh, uh, with us from Ukraine. He's a professor of political science and department chair at the Karazin, Karazin Kharkiv National University in Ukraine. He's well known to, to many of you as a uh, prolific political commentator. Um, his main interests are comparative politics and democratic theory. He's had basically visiting fellowships pretty much everywhere in North America at the Woodrow Wilson's Kennan Institute, um, the National Endowment for Democracy, Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at the University of Toronto, the Ellison Center at University of Washington, um, and many others. He's the author of the book, Democracy and Neopatrimonialism and Global Transformations. Um, and he uh, will wrap up this session. So uh, without further ado, I think I will start with you, Victor, from my hometown of snowy Toronto. And if you could start things off, that would be great. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Lucan. Um, I'm coming here sort of as an interloper. I'm actually a historian and I'm much less uh, versed in current affairs, especially in, in, in recent time, I've sort of withdrawn from all the goings on. I was following quite closely from 2014 when the war started. So I'm just gonna give some ruminations on, on, on what, what's, what's happened uh, with 2014 and where we are today. Of course, 2014 changed everything. The unthinkable happened. I mean, we were living in a post-war era with, um, of peaceful coexistence and no one really expected a, a war of aggression to occur. And the cards were completely shifted. So the Ukrainian state, which was obviously in the middle of a revolution, prepared 
understandably couldn't uh, couldn't respond or could croak at other countries. Um, the situation is that for the Russians, it was really a victory, a, a very bold and uh, well done operation that was a strategic, uh, in the short run, strategic, um, uh, an amazing victory. Uh, completely right now, until now, I mean, the Black Sea has become almost a Russian lake. I'll get back to why it's not complete in a minute. Um, a great four post for operation in the Mediterranean, the Crimea, um, Syria, Libya. Um, um, and so for the, um, it's a, just kind of a mem that goes around that, you know, Russia, Russia without Ukraine is no longer a superpower, a major power, an empire, which I think is a very harmful one because I mean, I mean, Ukraine of course is important strategically, uh, geographically, resources, industry, um, human resources. But I mean, still without Ukraine, it's it's still very much of a superpower if you look at the map, and it's very harmful. And on the other hand, you have sort of the converse of that is Ukraine as a great state, as, as a large European state, without Crimea is really very problematic. Um, loss of Crimea meant that Ukraine is surrounded on three sides by Russia, essentially. Uh, we see the Black Sea um, control of not just Crimea, but also the, the, the waters around it with all the resources are challenged and threatened and largely taken over. Um, it's a really untenable, horrible situation for Ukraine to have, have Crimea uh, in, in it, the hands of its avowed enemy um, that's been working for the past generation since the falls of Union to actually uh, absorb dissent, uh, or now um, somehow subdue or even just simply dissent, um, chop Ukraine up into pieces to take it, take it apart piece by piece, which has already begun, done in part. And the problem for Ukraine is um, this, this was I see was, was coming. Um, it was going on all along and you can't have a, you can't have a large biggest country in, in, in Europe with a government that is in a state and an army that uh, this the government is often has been said not really an army, um, not really a state, a pseudo state, a failed state. You have to govern it properly to control this territory. So we can see in the future things, things possibly getting worse. Though of course there are a lot of complicated factors. And I want to just say uh, two things um, about a bad bad news story and a good news story. I mean I could talk about things that have changed forever on the ground, okay, that are changing. We have a million more colonists uh, in Crimea, which, which Max will probably talk about. Um, the demographics should change, Crimean Tatars and Ukrainian conscious people are being pushed out. So that's a very serious problem for, for, the, for, for the break that we have. Um, but the, uh, the bad news, I mean, is the, of course, the, um, I'll share my screen now, is the water situation in Crimea. For Crimeans, for, um, share screen for um, the, pop, the ecology, uh, screen two for the ecology, uh, and I need to do slideshow, let's see, okay, that's the blank screen. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, so um, so water situations, of course, Crimea is dependent on the Ukrainian water from the Dnieper, um, and this, we have this great, great North, Korea, North uh, Crimean canal, um, there was a major project in the 50s, a strategic and, and very important, one of the reasons Khrushchev apparently handed Ukraine, uh, Crimea over to Ukraine, and Ukrainians claimed that they were the ones that built it. I mean, the, the finances are complicated, but this is a strategic um, um, uh, entity for Crimea. For what for Crimea is, I mean, it shows you what a big deal it was here. Crimea is not basically, cannot support a population that it had. It had two and a half million, now it may have three or more. Um, and is a uh, ecological disaster. Um, and of course, this brings a very serious strategic problem for Ukraine. Um, the um, the um, uh, Russia has to solve this problem. They're trying to, 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 to you know, aquifer water from the sea or, or bring it in the pipeline. There's always get it from aquifers under the underground, which has been destroying the aquifers. Um, of course, the, be the best solution is to make a deal with Ukraine to intimidate, as I was talking to Zelensky, that he wouldn't hold up and make the Ukraine give water to Crimea, which would, of course would be very difficult politically. Or simply, um, here's the other bad news, just simply to take over Kahovka, which is where this canal starts. Um, on the Dnieper, or it's called Tavris, it's quite a fitting name, or, or in Kaholka, uh, near, near Kherson. Um, so this, um, of course, is not, not unthinkable, but with Putin, you never know. Um, just this this fall, well, during the Belarusian, a month into the Belarusian, um, which is what the canal looks like now, into the Belarusian um, uh, protests, 
there was a um, planned um, Slavyansk, uh, 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 Russian, um, Belarusian and Serbian annual Slavyansk Bratstvo 2020. It's an annual military maneuvers. And one of the, one of the uh, um, actions of it was an anti-terrorist operation to take over a a hydrological, um, hydrological, what's called a hydrological vuzel or a hydrological entity or, or infrastructure, and of course, in the press was talking about this is actually to intimidate the whole, the whole, the whole um, um, uh, training, tra training and, and maneuvers was to intimidate the, the uh, Belarusian protesters, Belarus protesters, to possibly as a, as a scare tactic, also against NATO forces. But in fact, it was seen in Ukraine, um, correct or not um, as a as a trial uh, to, to take over the, the Kahoka the end of the Crimean Canal um, the, 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 the source of the um, and um, it, um, either as an intimidation uh, exercise or as actual training we don't know um, there's maybe paranoia but with, if you see that in the situation there's never never not never too little paranoia because anything can happen I mean in principle if Putin decides that things come to shove it, can, it, would, it would be a difficult war, conflict, perhaps, uh, or war, but he could basically take, just put troops, take over that, that, the canal, the entry point, or Kherson Oblast. And if you can do it, you say, okay, Wes, what are you going to do to me? You're going to nuke me? I mean, that's it. You know, and this could be, so it's always a very, a very, very present, clear and present danger. As far as good news goes, um, I think I have about two more minutes. Brooklyn, you said five, seven. Okay. The good news, though, is that um, in the meantime, um, well, the forces, the Russian forces in the Black Sea and Sea of Azov are much greater than, than those the Ukrainian ones. Um, about 20, 2018, it seems that NATO, it's been going on and on, constant maneuvers in the, in the Black Sea area. But it's more recently they've really woken up to the threat. And you have a constant NATO presence of US, British, French, and other Romanian ships. Of course, by the Treaty of Montrose, they have to go, it can only be in the Black Sea uh, for, uh, for a short time, but they're constantly going into the Black Sea and, and have a constant presence, especially when things get tense, when there's Russian Caucasus 2020 exercises or this other one in, in, in Belarus. Um, constant NATO presence, uh, which um, makes a difference. Um, and the other thing is most recently, something we've never, we never seen before, in September we had um, from North Dakota and from the UK, we had B-52s flying around Crimea, um, escorted by the Ukrainian, uh, the Ukrainian fighters, something we've never seen before. Not only B-52 bombers, uh, it's happened actually on two separate instances, but also KCRC, uh, KR-135 intelligence um, planes, um, um, uh, and so for the constant monitoring, which is of course a, a good sign. It shows you, I mean, during the Trump years, we sort of didn't know what, it's in the US policy, what's going was a drift, even though he gave javelins, but I think the javelins were, were really not a serious. I think personally, I think that it was a deal between the Russians and, 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 and or a wink wink thing between the Russians and, and, and the Trump, you know, okay, give them javelins. We'll try them out in the world. We'll see how, how we can handle them. And, and uh, U.S. will also learn something. It's not a real deterrent. In any event, during the Trump years and everything was adrift, it's interesting that we have the deep state in some form actually keeping track of things, keeping, hold, keeping a hold of the line. So that's sort of a, a positive point. Um, but in general, we don't know where we're going to go. Um, the Ukrainians say the only way we can get Crimea back is with armed forces there. Um, Russia has to die fall apart and go floating down the Dnieper River past Kiev. But it's much more complicated than that. We really don't know. Obviously, Russia is in deep, deep, you know what, being there too. That's all I have to say for now. Thank you. Uh, great. Thank, thank you, Victor. Uh, Max? Thank you, Lucan. Um, I was going to start differently today, but uh, I woke up to some news that is, I believe, relevant to our discussion today. Therefore, I will start, I will start with some news. Last night at 4 a.m. in the morning, uh, Russian enforcement services conducted searches in seven homes of Crimean Tatar activists in five different uh, towns of Crimea. As a result, uh, seven people were detained. Uh, one was released uh, after interrogation. And as I read an hour ago, um, five of those people have already been arrested uh, by the so-called court in the town of Simferopol. Uh, they're all being accused of terrorism and uh, participating of the so-called terrorist organization called Hezbut uh, Tahrir, Tahrir, 
And this is not the first time that uh, Crimean Tatars are being accused of terrorism and per of participating in this kind of organizations. This kind of arbitrary uh, persecution um, of uh, pro-Ukrainian people and Crimean Tatars in particular have been going on in Crimea uh, since 2014. I would like to focus uh, my presentation today on the topic of displacement and replacement of the population of Crimea since the occupation. Uh, since 2014, uh, occupational authorities have been pushing uh, pro-Ukrainian people out of Crimea uh, and uh, Crimean Tatars as Muslim population have been a specific target of this policy. Uh, Russia has been using propaganda and racist rhetoric in order to uh, target Crimean Tatars for the alleged Muslim terrorism. And the Hizbut uh, Tahrir case is one of the loudest political cases that um, we can hear about in, in that regard. Uh, and uh, Crimean Tatars are being accused of terrorism. In addition to that, uh, since 2014 and until 2016, 44 people uh, in Crimea have become victims of the forceful disappearance. That is according to the civic organization Crimea uh, SAS. Um, of those 44 people, uh, 15 are still missing and six have been found dead. Uh, as of today, there are 98 people in Crimea who are recognized as uh, political prisoners. 71 of them are Crimean Tatars. With this policy of pushing pro-Ukrainian people out, intimidating uh, Crimean Tatar population, the indigenous population of Crimea, uh, there is another tendency of bringing uh, Russian population to Crimea. This, is, this was especially noticeable uh, in early uh, 2014 when uh, the, all the elites of the bureaucratic uh, institutions, law enforcement, um, courts, judges, police, uh, have been uh, political uh, leadership has been, uh, has been gradually replaced by uh, incomers from Russia. In addition to that, Russian state organizes a number of campaigns uh, and uh, propaganda campaigns, as well as state programs that encourage resettlement of Russian population uh, to the territory of the pen peninsula. Uh, as of now, according to the official Russian statistics, um, we can, uh, according to the official uh, Russian statistics, the number of people who have been resettled uh, to Crimea since 2014 is uh, slightly over 200,000. However, in reality, this number might be uh, much higher. For example, in 2019, uh, Majlis uh, estimated that this number is close to 500,000. What this means for the demographic uh, situation in Crimea is that Russia is artificially changing the national composition of Crimea and political orientation of residents of the peninsula. If this tendency continues, the percentage of the indigenous people in Crimea, Crimean Tatars, may drop to the point when they're not, not, not any more noticeable on the political stage uh, of Crimea. This is especially important to take into the account in the, context, in the context of statements that we can hear since 2018, since the last presidential elections in Russia, those state statements were coming out of various kinds of Russian opposition, uh, calling for the resolution of the Crimean uh, conflict through a fair referendum. Uh, as we can see, with the, with the tendency of replacement of the local population in Crimea, this kind of referendum cannot be fair. The policy of replacement of uh, the local population brings me to the topic of my PhD research. This kind of replacement of population accompanied by rewriting of history, creating of various settlers uh, myths, uh, repression of undesired people, uh, marginalization of uh, the indigenous has a name in scholarship and is called settler colonialism. Uh, settler colonialism is what I just described. It is a type of foreign invasion that aims to replace the indigenous population of uh, a colonized territory uh, 
um, and uh, accompanied by the justification of such replacement uh, through, the cre uh, through the creation of propaganda, historical narratives, uh, the so-called settlers myths. The example of the settler colonial states are United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and others. Um, I argue in my research that Crimea has been a settler colony of Russian Empire and the Soviet Union since the first annexation of Crimea in 1783, and that since that time, there has been an ongoing conflict between the indigenous people of Crimea and the, uh, and the colonial power represented by settlers. We, and this conflict has been going on with various uh, levels of intensity this whole time. In 2014, this conflict resumed, intensified, you name it, and um, we see a yet another stage of its development right now. The historical myth that Crimea has always been Russian is a typical example of the settler's myth that erases the history of the colonized, uh, the colonized land and its people and replaces it with history of the metropole. The importance of such myths should not be underestimated. I truly believe that because of uh, the strengths of this myth that Crimea has always been Russian, there, uh, there was such a weak response to the uh, annexation of Crimea by the Ukrainian society and international community. Uh, as a result, while most uh, actors recognize that the occupation is illegal, many still acknowledge that it was morally fair. This is where the application of settler colonial uh, theory can be fruitful. It undermine, undermines the perception of fairness of settler colonization and gives voice to underrepresented indigenous people. I do hope for some questions and therefore I will stop for now. Thank you. Great, um, thank you, Max. That was very interesting. Gwen, do you want to take it over? Yes, thank you, Lucan, and thanks for inviting me to take part in this discussion today. Um, I must admit that when you asked me, Lucan, my first instinct was to say, um, I don't think I have anything new to contribute in terms of research because I, I haven't been able to go to Crimea and I haven't been able to do any research there. But then I thought um, it's, it's, it's so rare, as you said in, in, in your introduction at the moment to, to discuss Crimea, that, that in itself is important to also point out the things that we may only um, guess or may only half, half know about. And uh, without knowing what you would um, exactly talk about, Max, I think some of the things I want to highlight um, uh, follow on from what you describe as, as, as one of the big myths. And I agree uh, fully this argument that uh, Crimea has always been Russian, I think becomes more and more widespread the longer annexation lasts and, and not having kind of fresh impressions myself from the region and so mostly anecdotal evidence or contact with, with, with people that maintains. I used to go um, quite frequently. My book, however, I must say, um, deals with an earlier period of um, issues around Crimea in the post-Soviet period. So we're in a different era now. So I want to deliberately sort of take also that outsider's um, point of view and, and see how I or talk a bit about how I perceive these myths um, uh, taking hold partly by design, design, um, of course, on the part of, of Russia, but also by default, because we, we know less, we have less access, and we discuss um, uh, Crimea less. But before I come to that, I just want to briefly pick up on, on the last bit of research, actual research I was able to do with the help of local researchers in 2017 in um, a survey of about 2,000 people then, um, so three years after annexation, um, a, a staggering sort of almost 90% of respondents said that they had not traveled to other parts of Ukraine, and that was in the first three years. Um, that is, it's just to, to I just emphasize as to, to mention the, the effect it has on, um, uh, on the one hand, the physical effect of cutting off Crimea from Ukraine, but also the effect it has on, on personal links, on social linkages um, uh, between Crimea and the rest of Ukraine. And these figures can only obviously be even higher now. And, and another figure that I found staggering in 2017 was that over 40%, 44% told us that they have less contact with family members in other parts of Ukraine. 
So that means that's not only physical visits that were not possible anymore, um, but that's also contact generally um, had dropped off. So those figures I thought were, were staggering then and they can uh, only have got worse um, since then. Um, in, in terms of um, kind of this factor of time, sort of the longer um, annexation lasts, um, the lack of access um, to Crimea for um, journalists, for um, uh, in particular Western researchers, anybody who's not willing to, to go in via, via Russia, um, therefore also um, otherwise risking not being able to, to um, work in Ukraine again or, or, or enter Ukraine. Uh, I think one of some of the effects are around these myths, and I want to talk about four myths. The biggest one is the one that uh, Max mentioned. Uh, this argument, Crimea has always been Russian. I encounter it frequently at um, also events we have in in Berlin. It's it's a it's a uh, common argument, even after an acknowledgement, as obviously Western democratic actors, uh, political actors. Um, uh, keep referring to the annexation, obviously being illegal, not recognized, but then maybe not so much at the highest political level, but in public discourse, very quickly, the argument gets played back. Yes, but it was always Russian. So that means we, we disregard uh, a, a huge chunk of, of Crimean history. We've written the Crimean Tatars, the Crimean Khanate, also the Ottoman Empire out of Crimean history. And it is used as a justification, um, even if it is not meant like that initially, but it, over time, I think it, it, it fulfills that function and fulfills it very, unfortunately, very effectively. Um, a second myth is, is and, and again, I think the longer um, annexation lasts, the more this argument has taken hold, that there was pro-Russian mobilization in Crimea prior to 2014. And there wasn't. I'm not saying that there are not individuals who would have maintained um, arguments like this, that, that um, Crimea belonged to Russia. But this was not an, uh, an, an, an important argument at all that was mobilized in Crimea at the time. So I think um, getting some of the facts right of what was actually happening also in the run up to 2014 becomes ever more important. And things get blurry in, in most people's perceptions, I think. Um, Another, the third myth that goes with the, the, this argument of pro-Russian mobilization before 2014 is the argument about discrimination of Russians um, in Crimea. Um, uh, having uh, a majority of, of ethnic Russians, although even though have often mixed backgrounds in Crimea, is not the same as saying immediately they had to be discriminated. And, and, and if we look at the facts, we know that um, no uh, restrictive um, policies on Russian language or anything to do with um, Russian ethnicity were ever implemented in, in Crimea. On the contrary, it was, um, it was often deliberately not touched those issues to not upset um, certain balances and integrate Crimea politically. Um, so that argument, which, which of course is a Russian, Russian argument that there was discrimination and they had to um, come to the help of, of um, citizens in Crimea, doesn't hold, but it also, and I think um, that, that, that myth um, uh, grows. And the fourth one is the, the reference to the referendum, and we've already mentioned it, that the, even the term referendum, even people who know that it wasn't a, a free referendum, um, nevertheless, by using this term, the fact that there was some sort of a process of voicing um, opinion on um, uh, um, kind of integration, reintegration with Russia, um, that it, it's in itself, I think, also fosters this, um, this myth. And alongside these myths, I think two, there are two very important silences in the, in the public discussion. And we have, or maybe three actually, um, one is the one about the, the big demographic changes happening. One is the one about repression in particular against Crimean Tatars. And the third one that we haven't mentioned yet is, is a general downplaying of links between Ukraine as a, as a whole and, and its region, Crimea, so that uh, Crimea was politically, economically integrated into the Ukrainian state. So there's not much room for that discussion, either historically or in, in more contemporary times. And I think I have already talked for more than five minutes. I stop here. Thank you so much, Gwen. Alexander? Uh, thank you for your introduction, Lukan. It's my pleasure to participate in such interesting event. In my short talk, I intend to outline the development of Crimea issue under the administration of Volodymyr Zelensky 
since the res recent 2019 presidential and parliamentary elections. Of course, Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014 has attracted the increased attention of academics as well as policymakers. Most of this attention has focused on the international dimensions of the crisis and the great power game geopolitics and the Black Sea security. While international dimensions and geopolitics are important, one should not overlook the domestic implications of foreign policy issues, and especially how the Crimea case contributes to domestic political shifts and shape the domestic political landscape. The peculiarity of Ukraine is that foreign policy issues are an important part of its domestic political agenda and internal political cleavages. Ukraine uh, lacks the resources to restore control over Crimea and change the international status quo in the Black Sea region. But Ukrainian presidents have enough resources and enough powers to change domestic political agenda and political status quo via different foreign policy initiatives. Let me demonstrate how Crimea case works as a striking example of these foreign policy tools and how Zelensky tries to develop a brand new strategy towards uh, Crimea and uh, Crimea reoccupation. Uh, there are three main steps in the development of Zelensky Crimea policy since 19, uh, 2019. Uh, firstly, during the speech at the age of, of Crimea Forum in February 2020, Zelensky said uh, that the return of Crimea is an indisputable uh, part of Ukraine national idea and that Kyiv will not recognize the annexation of the peninsula by Russia in exchange for peace in, Don in Donbass and settlement of Donbass crisis. Secondly, on September uh, 14, uh, 2020, uh, President Zelensky issued a decree uh, adapting the third version of the national security strategy of Ukraine under the title Security of the Person, Security of the Country elaborated by the National Security Council of Ukraine. This is the most important Ukrainian official national security document that clearly delineates Russia as the biggest long-term systemic threat to the, to the national security of Ukraine and as an aggressive state uh, that illegally occupies Ukrainian territory of Crimea as well as some part of the Donbass region. These documents also, also for the first time contains a very important statement on Crimea, namely that Ukraine will defend the rights, liberties, and legal interests of the citizens of the temporarily occupied territories of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol, and will uh, pursue your uh, initiatives uh, for the reintegration of these territories and the social protection and support of the populations that is living uh, on the indicated territories, as well as defend the rights and liberties of uh, those persons that belong to the Crimean Tatar nation, the Karaites and the Krimchaks, and will keep these issues on the international agenda. Uh, finally, uh, the third one, uh, final step, uh, so-called uh, Crimean platform on September 23, 2020, during the last United Nations General Assembly session, Zelensky called on partners to join the international platform aimed to protecting the rights of Crimean inhabitants and ultimately uh, the deoccupation of the Crimea Peninsula. The key activities of the Crimean platform include such issues as the international policy of non-recognition of the annexation of Crimea, the effectiveness of sanctions, security, human rights, and international law, environmental and economic consequences of the occupation. Ukraine seeks international support to keep and advance the ex existing Crimea-related sanctions to secure a Ukrainian uh, maritime economic zone and freedom of international navigation in the Black Sea and Anzov Sea region attract international attention to human rights violations of local Ukrainians and Crimea Tatars, including issues of their cultural and religious identities. As Ukrainian Foreign Ministry Dmitry Kuleba said, we will increase the cost of Russian human rights violation in Crimea 
and the militarization of Crimea by advancing the scope of sanctions. The occupied Crimea is very expensive for Russia and will be even more expensive, uh, said Kuleva. In contrast to Donbass case, which is in the focus of international community, thanks to so-called Normand reform act, bringing together France, Germany, and Russia, there was no such platform covering Crimea case. The platform will operate at several levels. The first one, the highest one, is the political level, which will involve heads of states and governments. The second one is the level of foreign ministers and defense ministers. The third one, incorporation of the uh, incorporations of MPs and uh, parliamentary people. The fourth, bring together experts. The Crimean Platform Summit event with top foreign leaders is set on August 23, 2021, just before uh, Ukraine's Independence Day. I uh, argue that the Zelensky Crimea platform is an interesting example of reconfiguration of domestic uh, political cleavages while developing new foreign policy agenda based on priority of humanitarian issues and international law. Uh, the central implication for domestic politics is the formation of a new composition of the pro-presidential majority in the parliament. Uh, Zelensky uh, defends Ukraine's statehood from the position of political centuries and moves from center left to center right political segment. In my view, that is important step in preparation for the next presidential campaign for the second term at the presidential office in 2024. Thank you for your attention. Great. Um, thank you to all of you. Um, that was a really fascinating presentation. First of all, I want to say that um, you can ask questions on Q&A. Um, I strongly encourage you to do that. I've already seen a number of questions. Um, I want to warn you, you may see my children screaming in the background. All is OK. Do not worry. Um, so I guess I just want to start things off with um, a, a few questions. First of all, I actually want to talk about something that Victor raised, which was the water question. Um, what my what I re I read that sort of before the invasion, you know, Ukraine supplied eighty five percent of fresh water to Crimea. Um, so I guess the question is how how I mean that that seems that would be seem to be quite hard for Crimea to replace. Um, I mean, how has that happened? Has there been water shortages? Or I mean, um, what is, um, what's been going on with access to water in Crimea? Yeah. Do you want me to uh, answer? Sure. Um, so, um, yeah, it's the most of the water is for agricultural purposes. I mean, Crimea naturally, the northern Crimean steppe, which is very different from the southern sort of Riviera, um, is is extension of the Ukrainian steppe is a very um, kind of continental climate. Um, and uh, it's basically steppe, uh, quasi desert. Um, it's unsuitable for agriculture without irrigation. With with the um, northern North Crimean Canal, it became a, a wonderful place for agriculture, um, and that is generally declining. It's going to, if the water situation continues, it'll be it'll turn back into steppe, quasi desert. Um, it's natural ecological uh, um, uh, state. The population is undergoing, um, there's, depends on the rainfall to what degree the, the reservoirs are full, but the population is under um, under a lot of pressure just recently. And it's gonna, just recently the other day, they, they're, they've announced cutoffs of water in Sevastopol and other places, um, very strict um, cutoffs. And it's not clear if this is because they have to do it or because they're trying to heat up the political Know, the whatever anti-Ukrainian sentiment or whatever, or, or the state of states were being besieged, but it is a it is a definite crisis uh, as far as that goes. Somebody asked about the, the, the map. I'm sorry, I didn't explain it. It's just the map of the canal going from the Dnieper, where which all the water comes from, it's 80 percent of the water, to through the isthmus connecting Crimea, going into various parts of Crimea. Um, so it's a very very serious problem. Again, as I say, I stress that if it's not, it has to be resolved. I, I don't understand how, why the Russians have moved. I mean, there's, there's a huge militarization of Crimea right now. That's one of the biggest themes. If you follow Andriy Klemenko, who's one of the leading experts on Crimea and um, Black Sea policy, 
I recommend them very highly on the Clemenko. You can find him on Facebook. He just put out a full, another report. Um, he he um, stresses that um, um, the, 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 I mean, if they don't resolve the problem, they're going to have to um, either, how, how can they move all these people there if they, if, if two and a half million or whatever it was before was way too much, too many people, okay? Why are they doing this? I don't understand. Is it the militarization? Is it, Klimenko's pointed out that about a large percentage of the people actually surprising coming into Crimea are actually from the Donbass who um, came as refugees into Russia and then moved to the Crimea, which is interesting. Do they want to be you know, on, on, on territory that's somehow more familiar? Maybe the Russians don't trust the pop, even the population voted, actually, well, we don't know, but was actually largely sympathetic to the Russians in the beginning, at least. Maybe the population is not trusted enough. This is, a, 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 again, changing facts on the ground, bringing more colonists from Russia that, are pure, that, that will make it more stable, their, their long-term holding. I mean, that's the obvious thing. When you change the fact, the, the facts on the ground, you don't go around, you know, the, the modern liberal and international order is whoever lives or that's, that's, that's where he is, we leave it at that. And that's what they're trying to do, perhaps. So. Great. Um, I mean, you don't deport, you don't deport people once they're there. So. Right. Um, so maybe I'll just actually follow on that with the you know, next question, which you partly answered, Victor, regarding this, the, the number of people from Russia resettled into Crimea. Um, I mean, it, maybe this is something you raised, Max. So, you know, what is your sense of the composition of, of this resettlement? Are, you know, are, is, are most of them from Ukraine via Donetsk? Do you agree with that assessment? And also, you know, what are they doing when they come to Crimea? I mean, they, you know, <laughs> I mean, where are they, how are they making livelihood? Is, is the Russian government simply providing them subsidies or do they have jobs? You know, are they entering the private sector? Um, yeah. I don't know much. I don't know much about people coming from Donbass. Also, of course, certainly I did hear some information about that, but in early 2014, um, there was a wave of people coming from mainland Russia from Russia itself, especially from uh, the northern parts of Russia where they had money, um, coming to live, coming for permanent residence in Crimea, uh, resettled for work, uh, like prosecutors, policemen, uh, officers, especially military, they're all coming with families, right? Um, there are special programs uh, waged by uh, the Russian government uh, for cheap credits. So cheap mortgages to buy homes in Crimea uh, for people from Russia. Um, so yeah, they, they, they come to live. I don't know, uh, many of them are uh, the state sector, but, but that is not exclusive. So many, many of them do come for private, private sector, come to live, people, usually people who have money Russian uh, states organized the whole propaganda campaign, advertising Crimea as a place with a warm climate, place, place to live, right? So as a result, many people from uh, regions with not such warm climate come to Crimea. That was especially, especially uh, noticeable in earlier stages during the, all, all of this hype, we would say around um, Crimean annexation. Great. Um, and then I guess um, the, the next question actually uh, comes from Emily Ch Chanel Justice. Uh, could someone talk about Crimean Tatars claims for protections at the international level based on their status as an, an indigenous population? Does this play into the new Crimean platform at all? I guess this is a question for you, Alexander, or anybody can answer this. You're gonna to have to turn off your. You have to turn off your mute. Uh, I think that the main focus of uh, Ukrainian platform is to intensify a uh, humanitarian dimension of uh, Crimean questions and uh, with special attention to uh, human rights violation and uh, violations of religious uh, and uh, identity issues of. Uh, local population in uh, Crimea. And second important one is the uh, humanitarian phase of uh, Crimea uh, issue. I mean, uh, 
that uh, there are a lot of problems for people who reside in Crimea or have a uh, registration of Crimea to get access to uh, administrative uh, service, to bank account in Ukraine or to educational system. And the first step, uh, steps of, of Ukrainian um, administration, uh, uh, Andrei Zelensky, uh, uh, was connected with the developing of new approaches to these uh, questions. For example, uh, uh, on July, uh, in July, uh, on the session of Verkhovna Rada, uh, the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine voted for simplifications of the procedure for graduates from Ukraine, uh, from uh, temporary occupied territories of Donetsk and Luhansk and Crimea to enter to, uh, to a higher educational institution in Ukraine. And since uh, 2020, applic applicants from temporary occupied territories will be able to enter uh, to the Ukrainian higher education universities under simplified procedure without passing the external independent testing. That is huge development of humanitarian dimensions of the, of, of the crisis. Max, did you want to say something? Yeah, uh, regarding uh, the use of uh, the indigenous status by Crimean Tatars. I know that Crimean Tatars have been involved in various uh, forms, uh, mostly as part of Ukrainian delegations to the international organizations. So uh, in, uh, as part of United Nations, various committees of the United Nations, including those uh, responsible for dealing with indigenous people in different places in the world. So Crimean Tatars are involved in that. In addition, we need to talk about Crimean Tatar Majlis, of course, right? Uh, the representative body of uh, Crimean Tatar people, who, uh, which is, uh, by the way, uh, prosecuted and banned uh, in Russia. Um, so Majlis keeps stressing that there should be no conversation about Crimea without Crimean Tatars sitting at the table. And by the way, your introduction, when you uh, look and acknowledge the uh, land on which uh, uh, the University of Toronto is standing, that is kind of the same principle here. Uh, there can be no conversation about Crimea without Crimean Tatars. Great. Um Thank you. Uh, so Frank Sisson had a question about the, um, the role of Turkey and Turkish-Ukrainian relations in, in this. Any, can anybody comment on that? Maybe uh, Victor? You're muted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Turkey plays, uh, there we go. Turkey plays a funny role. Um, it's there, the, the Erdogan has always been very, um, for the most part, very cozy with, with Putin and they cooperate in a lot of things, um, gas pipeline and the Black Sea and other things strategically. But on the other hand, whenever it comes to Crimean Tatars, they've always been very supportive of them. In 2015, I had the privilege of being funded going to their uh, International Congress of the Crimean Tatars, which was the first time held outside of Ukraine. Um, it was decided not to hold in Kiev, but in Ankara. And, um, and, and a lot of money was put into this. They're constantly, Jemilev and, and others are, were always going to Turkey and they really countered, looked up to the Turks. On the other hand, the Turks never, never um, uh, uh, put any sanctions on Russia at all. They're one of the only countries in, uh, that, well, so compared to Europe, no sanctions whatsoever, as far as I know. So they're always playing this double game. And it's sort of like, um, you know, Russia can sort of stir up the Kurdish issue against the Turks if they want to. The Turks can sort of stir up the Crimean Tatar issue against, against the Russians if they want to. But there's, it's really been a, a kind of a, not a very strong support as far as I can tell. Um, very sort of, um, very uh, political campaign. Yeah, Gwen? I just jump in with, I, I completely agree. And I just wanted to um, uh, kind of give also that example that I think uh, before the annexation of Crimea, Crimean Tatars were always in, in Crimea disappointed that there wasn't more support coming from uh, Turkey, which has this, this big, potentially big um, Crimean Tatar diaspora, but it's also, of course, in Turkey, not, not organized as, as such. And then um, promises that were made, um, were, as far as I can see, um, never fulfilled at the state level. There has been uh, private money coming in through Crimean Tatar circles, supporting causes, but it was 
um, only a, a tiny fraction was actually Turkish uh, sort of government support for Crimea. And they also promised um, uh, that they would build housing for displaced people in, in Ukraine. As far as I know, that hasn't, hasn't happened either, but it's, it's, it's sort of more um, that there's symbolic um, uh, support from the government. I might also add that, that as far as going back to Ukraine, I mean, uh, during President Poroshenko's presidency, there was all this talk of Crimean national autonomy, which is something the Crimean Tatars really wanted to have. And on one hand, it looks kind of, I mean, all the, th all the positive things Ukraine started doing once it lost it looked kind of ridiculous because you know, they should have done it before, but even that would have been a very symbolic gesture. And it never came to be, obviously it's complicated, um, but um, some of the Crimean Tatars were really counting about, um, and I, I think they've even stopped talking about it. <laughs> to have this national autonomy declared. Right. I have a question actually about the response to the invasion in the former Soviet Union. You know, what's interesting, I know, I know that um, Lukashenko in Belarus, you know, refused to recognize Ossetia and Abkhazia, which is a little bit surprising um, given um, you know, Lukashenko's pro, in principle pro-Russian stance. I mean, has there been a kind of a, any kind of similar resistance from other post-Soviet states um, to the annexation of Crimea or what has been the response? Anybody have any? As far as I remember, Armenia and so forth, they didn't, when, the, when there was a UN vote, Armenia and those countries that supported Russia or abstained. I don't think uh, Kazakhstan, and none of the post-Soviet countries supported Ukraine on this, which was um, seen very in a very bitter way by the Ukrainian side. Um, can anybody talk about um, what the sort of Degrees of repression in Crimea, you know, relative to Russia, is it, I mean, is it sort of worse than Russia? Is it about the same? I mean, it's obviously must be much worse than it was, you now infinitely worse than it was on Ukraine. But is there any sense of sort of how open or closed uh, Crimea is relative to the to what is an, an authoritarian Russia? Uh, Victor, can you? Yeah, I can only say one thing that was a shock for me. I mean, we were used to, I mean, the Crimean Tatar Medjlis, for example, it was there for a long time. And we, it sort of seemed like it would be there. And we were all shocked how quickly they closed it down, how quickly they clamped down uh, in 2014 and into 15. Uh, the, 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 just the, the resoluteness and brutality with which the Crimean Tatar civil, civil organizations were closed down was really quite striking. I mean, um, right. And then I, we have a couple of questions about the, the Nord Stream pipeline, Nord Stream Two pipeline. Um, can someone talk about sort of what would be the impact of that being completed? Um, yeah, go ahead. I have a feeling on the screen that you're looking at me because I'm based in Berlin. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's just How on did my you screen. Feel it? Yeah. Um, uh, well, I think the. Let me put this straight straight out there. I think it's it's Nord Stream is a mistake from the beginning to the end. Um, but I personally am skeptical that it still will be stopped. But and now it looks as if maybe some mechanism will be found. It looks like to me, with um, the Biden administration, that maybe there might be mechanisms to to uh, interrupt it if certain agreements are not kept, if Ukraine is kept out of the gas transit and so on. So I think they will come up with some some sort of compromises. My my um, hunch. It is. Um, I think it's a political mistake in, in several ways. And the main one is um, that it uh, is, is obviously detrimental to Ukraine. Um, but Crimea in, is not, has not been a, a key part of this argument. So nobody currently is, is arguing over North Stream because of Crimea. I mean, this could, could have entered the, the discussion, but it's not. It's about other economic interests and political pressure on Ukraine from, from the Russian side. Um, uh, and and then other um, issues, of course, like is there a European um, energy policy or isn't there if, if, if some countries push ahead with this? Is this environmentally sound? No, it's not. So there's a range of issues, but also US opposition to it is not based on an argument about um, Crimea and is also um, uh, strongly driven by economic interests as well. So um, it's um, unfortunately Crimea is not part of this, but overall it would, of course, um, through limiting gas transit through Ukraine, um, um, be extra leverage over over Ukraine. Thank you. Um, anybody else? So, yeah, Victor, gotta, gotta turn off your unmute yourself. Oh, yeah, the whole it's a cobbler. 
so the whole raison d'etre for this for the Russians we know other than to undercut Ukraine economically is, um, I mean, we, if you want to have a good, a, a good old fashioned war, then you can have it there in Ukraine without cutting off Europeans gas, Europe's gas. Um, and I mean, that, that's, there's something that that's in the, in the background there. You know, Russia would be very, 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 uh, very uh, timid about going, ha having a normal war there if the gas would, would be cut off. But now we have Nord Stream 1 and 2 and Ukraine's, you know, anything can happen as long as the nuclear power plants don't go, <laughs> don't blow. Um, that's not questions about the, the border between Ukraine and Crimea. I know that, um, that my understanding is that the border between the separatist parts of Donbass are actually quite porous. That, that the reports I've heard that people go back and forth quite a lot in reality. Um, is this true? What's the situation in Crimea? Is it completely shut the border or is there any population movements? And what is the sort of other efforts to kind of make someone asked about the, whether there are efforts to make kind of people to people contacts between Ukraine and Crimea. Um, so what are the ties there? Yeah, Max? I can try to answer this question only partially. Um, I don't quite know about the situation during the COVID times because uh, uh, something we haven't mentioned today is COVID in Crimea is a big problem, uh, especially after last summer when um, Russian tourists went to Crimea instead of uh, uh, other countries because of COVID. Uh, so I don't know, I, I know there is some movement across the border right now, but it is very limited because of COVID. But in pre-COVID times, movement was very common. Uh, people from Crimea were going to Ukraine in particular to get um, Ukraine foreign pas passports, for example, um, to, to get Ukrainian food and, and, and all, this, all this kind of stuff. So there was, there was a relatively active movement. Also, you had to cross the so-called border uh, administrative line, right? Between, uh, with, with Russian border guards checking your passports, right? Uh, I cannot really comment on what's going on there today. Yeah, Gwen. Yeah, obviously I can't comment exactly on what's going on on the ground, but uh, I, I, I think it would be misleading to say that there are huge flows of people going across. No, and it's not um, in the um, uh, so-called contact line in the Donbass. There's only certain points where you can cross, but but there's there's much more traffic across it. So I think in in uh, Crimea or to get into Crimea from uh, the north, you, you need to have a, a good reason, meaning family relations um, to, to get in. So I, I don't know under what conditions um, um, others can, can enter. Um, and that experience uh, we know from many descriptions is, is far from pleasant uh, to go in and then go to come back out. So, so I think um, these, these um, uh, figures, which I think that I mentioned only gave a certain trend already in 2017, um, there is, uh, it's not completely closed off, but um, a lot of um, sort of normal traffic back and forth is, is not possible or is made so um, difficult with, with various administrative and from the Russian side border like structures. And that's become a, a, a more um, securitized line as well. Is, um, uh, that's more, I would say, the exception um, than, than the rule. So my next question uh, relates to uh, Ukrainian policy towards Crimea, um, this, I guess primarily to Alexander, but could be to others. I mean, obviously Ukraine will never rhetorically, you know, recognize Russian control over Crimea, but I'm wondering whether there's any force in Ukraine which seriously is making an effort or is planning or, you know, to, to, to regain control over Crimea, or whether there's been kind of an implicit kind of giving up. Um, on that issue? Unfortunately, Ukraine uh, at this moment uh, doesn't have uh, enough resources to restore the status quo before uh, 2014, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, in contrast to Don Pass case, there are a lot of consens consensus be be between different Ukrainian political uh, forces and political parties about uh, Crimea. Crimea is a part of Ukraine, and Crimea is a 
will be in Ukraine uh, in contrast to different uh, conceptions about future of Donbass. So about Donbass, we have a lot of different uh, discussions and debate from different political uh, forces. But about Crimea, we have a lot of consensus. So I guess the, the follow-up question would be, this is something that uh, Max addressed in his presentation, but I would like you know the views of others, is you know what explains the lack of any kind of violent resistance to, to, to Russian takeover? Um, was it just the wrong time in Ukrainian history because everything was in such disarray? Or is, you know, what, why wasn't there more of a, I mean, even sort of guerrilla type warfare? I mean, obviously there's a huge, you know, asymmetry between Russia and Ukraine, but you know, even weak states can can make life hell for invaders. So, um, can someone speak to that? Anybody? Yeah, Victor. Uh, well, I mean, the Crimean Tatars felt very vulnerable. There was there was some talk of this, but they realized that if this happened, they would. I mean. Um, they would basically, not, you know, experience another, another genocide or deportation or something like that. I think um, population pff, really was there wasn't enough support for that. You know, population, much of it was we don't know what the actual. Some people say it was only thirty percent that voted or something, but in any event, there wasn't really there was a there was kind of a groundswell initial uh, welcoming of, of, of the Russian occupation. So there was not that. But about, I mean, um, about military, uh, forward military action in, Ukraine, in Crimea. Right now, Ukraine is just trying to make sure that it doesn't, that doesn't get worse. I mean, Odessa is always constantly under threat. There's always talk that maybe another Odessa People's Republic comes out. The control of the waters uh, is a problem. Uh, that's why NATO, NATO uh, uh, is being very, very helpful in making sure that those lines aren't crossed. Um, and uh, yeah, but as far as just in Crimea, you, you it just it wasn't in the cards any kind of <laughs> resistance. I think. Though people like Andriy Klemenko talk about that, it will only happen when eventually, when uh, Ukraine with other support others, will be able to actually bring its military in there. That's the only way. So that, that makes shows you how hopeless it may seem. But you never know, of course, and, as we know. Um. Okay, so someone else had a question about. I mean, we, I mean, I think it's we can we all agree that the the referendum was was you know not in any way free and fair. But does anybody have a sense of had there been a free and fair referendum? I mean, this obviously would have presumed that there wasn't a Russian military presence. You know, what would have been the level of support for separatism, say, in twenty thirteen? Yeah, Max. I would say we simply don't know. Uh, I can only reference Andriy Klimenko, who, who was just mentioned here by Professor Ostapchuk. I spoke to Andriy Klimenko several years ago, and he, as an expert on Crimea, said that according to their estimations, estimations of his organization and uh, their studies of, um, of, of Crimean um, views, of views of Crimean people, the tendencies in uh, early two, uh, 2010, so, so like uh, a few years before the annexation and actually in 2013, the tendencies were very unpleasant uh, for Russia. And um, this was not very advertised as a result, like this res the result of the study was not very advertised, but the tendencies were not good with more people, more and more people, if not leaning, like liking Ukraine or becoming more of a, like tolerant citizens of Ukraine and uh, acknowledging uh, that they, their life is connected to Ukraine. We should address, we, we should take into account that the amount of propaganda that uh, was filled, uh, that, that was, uh, um, Cover, uh, the, the amount of propaganda in the news in Crimea in 2013 during the Maidan and after absolutely distorted the, the picture. Uh, with the amount of people brought in, this also distorts the picture. So I believe we simply cannot talk about any fair referendum before uh, a serious and long lasting work is done. Yeah, the point is that 
you don't, civilized referendum happens after quite a bit of time of discussion of civil society stepping in, like you had with the head of Scotland or wherever else. It doesn't happen in one month or one week or even in a half a year. You need at least a year or two for the discussion to occur. Gwen? Yeah, I just wanted to say, as I mentioned initially in my, my remarks, I mean, there was no mobilization around this issue, so we cannot, uh, we cannot judge by that. And we, what we can um, analyze is that Crimea was um, completely politically integrated into the southeast of Ukraine with all the political trends that went um, with that. Um, so that, um, I think, is also one indication how far political integration had, um, had gone. Okay. Um, does anybody have, okay, I think that I think about wraps it up. Um, I get, oh, actually, one more question. Martin Kisley says, um, seems like we don't know enough about what is going on in Crimea right now. Is it possible to conduct any sort of research in Crimea or is that just off the table? If one wanted to, <laughs> but I, I, know, I, just I want to show that that it is possible right now for, for example, Ukrainian researchers. Yeah. And research institution. Sorry, what did you say that again? Well, I think that that is not uh, possible for Ukrainian uh, for Ukrainian research institutions. Is yeah, and also yeah. also for international researchers, it's um, uh, not possible. Um, so yeah. it it also has something to do with um, access um, to to Crimea and and also. Ukrainian legislation on that, but nevertheless, it would be also a very hard setting in which to to conduct research. But access, I think, is from 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 different sides is is one critical issue here to also keep awareness um, about what's going on. And this is about researchers, but also journalists, in particular, international journalists, um, uh, getting getting access. Um, then developments would be better documented than they currently are. So I think that's also in. Ukraine's interest um, to to actually enable access. Max, I will just um, try to um, this briefly describe my, my my personal opinion that I developed over the last several seven years. Uh, it's a po it was a point of ethics of studies on the territory of Crimea. I believe that it is ethically inappropriate to conduct such studies. Because the way you, the way journalists are ethically not allowed to interrogate prisoners, for example, right, or interrogate people under torture, the way no but scholars cannot really conduct studies in places of unfreedom, in places where people are afraid to talk, in places where people can get in trouble, serious trouble for talking. Gwen, you want to? Yeah. Um, I completely agree that that raises very serious also ethical issues in, in research. But of course, there is um, research, there's, there's um, good journalistic uh, work on authoritarian um, countries and uh, repressive regimes. And there's also uh, good academic research on that. So it, it, it raises the bar and it is methodologically difficult, it is ethically difficult. But um, I, for me, at least, that would not be a, be a reason to not try and, 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 and conduct research. And of course, it uh, means a lot of things about guarding the, the anonymity of people, the safety of people. Some things are not possible. But I think not trying to research authoritarian repressive setting, settings um, is, it cannot be the way forward either. Then we're even further removed from what's going on in those societies. And of course, I mean, people, you know, researched the Soviet Union when it was quite a closed society. So, I mean, it seems like it's at least in principle possible, right? Um, so I- um, There's a question I, about Kozlov. Frank just has a question at the very end, have you seen it? Yeah, um, so uh, I have a couple, couple questions. Um, one is from Matthew Light, um, Professor Matthew Light at the University of Toronto, who asks about Russian opposition to Crimean um, occupation um, in Russia. Um, I know that um, it's well known that Navalny and, and many Russian opposition, you know, support uh, Crimea, as does, you know, a large share of the Russian public, at least according to public opinion polls. And that was certainly my impression, you know, anecdotally, when I, when I visited to Russia, the most sort of common people, I mean, the I, think if I'm, I think the very first um, 
Russian phrase I ever heard when I went to the Soviet Union in 1988 was "Krim Nash," right? <laughs> um, you know, that Crimea was. Or this was in 1991. But um, so, can someone speak to that? I mean, are, is there are there any sort of forces in Russia who oppose the the occupation? Um, I mean, no, go ahead, Victor. No, no, I just, I was thinking either you or Max or, or Gwen can probably answer that better. <laughs> go ahead, Gwen. I mean, I, I, I would have said, I mean, there are no um, politically audible forces. I mean, there might be, um, I think it, not so much, I don't see a, a political sort of demand for, for ending annexation um, forming in Russia. What I think there is, I think for most Russians, the topic is just over, that's done and, 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 and they've moved on and it's no longer uh, sort of any boost for, for Putin's popularity, that's gone as well. But I think um, there is an increasing um, realization of the costs. And, and if you just, I mean, the Russian government is very, tries very hard to obscure the figures and not, not really be um, so open about it, but even according to the, the budget, what's um, transferred to, to Crimea also this year, that is higher than to Dagestan and Chechnya, I mean, individually. Um, so that does, I think, create a sense, um, is this really worth it? And, and the money could go somewhere else in a situation where socioeconomically, the Russian population is, is, um, is worse off. So I think that is rumbling a little, but I don't see that forming into a into a political call and um, I'm not aware of there's also a question about protests in in Crimea I think the situation I would think is so uh, securitized and militarized that that cannot um, happen there. I mean one thing I should add on the latter question is that my understanding is that you know it's very similar in the, in the British Empire that the left was not particularly in Britain opposed to to colonialism, this is, you know, this is not uncommon historically, right? I mean, I, I don't know if Max, you can speak to that. You know, I think in most cases, the opposition in, in, in you know, the colonial centers, you know, for them, you know, they're just, they're not interested in opposing colonialism. Is that right? Is that your sense? Yeah, this is correct. Yeah. I mean, also it's, it's not, I mean, it's not easy for Russia altogether. I mean, the, the, especially the monitoring groups like like the Kremenko's group, they keep track of every ship that comes into Crimean ports, and these things are, are very easy to track with resources on the internet. And any ship that goes into Crimea is in, is in trouble of being either seized or being sanctioned on it. Or right now, there's a big another issue. For example, there's an architect, arch, Austrian architectural firm that's building a theater, I believe, in Sevastopol, and they are being very heavily, um, a lot of slack now um, for doing this. Um, they could, you know, certainly not operate in Ukraine, but fall under other sanctions. So it's really not, it's not easy. They're harassed quite a bit. Um, economically, Crimea is really crippled because of, of, the, of the, even the, the income, I mean, the sanctions officially are very strong, but even if them not being kept, it's a very, it's, it's, Russia is under a lot of, is, is under a lot of uh, um, constraints there. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, that was, was a question by Frank Sisson that I wanted to answer. Oh, the, did I? See did I go the Carriage Bridge. Um, would anyone want to discuss the significance? Yeah, so would bridge? anyone want to discuss? This is from Frank, Professor Frank Sisson. Would anyone discuss the significance of the Carriage Bridge and the closing of the sea as a, of a, as off? Um, does this move not make it all the more crucial for Ukraine not to recognize the Russian annexation? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a disaster for Ukraine, the closing of the Kyiv of Azov. Um, the economic pressure, I mean, this economic war is very, very important there. I mean, the, attempt, the attempt is, of course, to close down Mariupol and Badjansk can cause an, an, uh, industrial or civil unrest because the economy is being destroyed. And, um, you know, that's why they had to increase the train, co the train connections between the steel plants there and, in Odessa or whatever. But in, so it's very difficult. The stopping of ships, uh, the delays of up to two days of ships and stuff. Recently, um, I, I just read right from again from Andriy Klemenko that when Ukraine put in a couple of um, uh, patrol boats in, it actually lessened the situation because most of the sh the, the Russian um, naval craft running these kind these kind of uh, harassment and it's actually with FSB FSB uh, run and they don't really like to have any kind of contact. The Ukrainians said that if you come within 300 meters of us, we're going to shoot. Um, they basically backed off. As far as the Kerch Bridge goes, I mean that's, that's that's another disaster for Ukraine. I mean that this is a, bit of a huge important, important infrastructure uh, 
uh, piece of infrastructure. It's Ukrainians have been saying and hoping and praying and laughing that this is going to collapse because of the tectonic situation there, and we may still do it. But so far, so so far, so good for them as far as the bridge goes. So another major Russian um, uh, victory, you could say, establishing this connection. And yeah, of course, of course, <laughs> Ukraine will never, as long as it's you know, it tries to be a, a, a normal state, will never can, can never really uh, uh, agree to the annexation of Crimea. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you each. Uh, this is obviously a very difficult topic. I mean, particularly given the sort of dearth of information, um, but it's been a very fruitful discussion. And, and thank you, especially to Professor Vizun, who's, you know, must be quite late. <laughs> Was it now after 11 o'clock in Ukraine or in also Max too? So, you know, good, good night, <laughs> sweet dreams. Uh, but anyways, I, I really appreciate, um, and Gwen as well, um, all of you uh, for coming to this. Um, Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you.